Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel, and today's activity is experimental verification of parallel circuit properties. Our objective today is to verify parallel circuit properties using real-world components and common electrical instrumentation. We'll observe that voltage across elements hooked in parallel is the same, and we'll use Ohm's law, Kirchhoff's current law, and the current divider rule to predict observed quantities. We'll demonstrate the effects of opens and shorts inside parallel circuits. Finally, we'll wrap up the exercise with a bonus round lab activity that includes voltage sources in parallel. This activity will tie together a number of topics, including basic parallel circuit properties, Kirchhoff's current law, and the current divider rule, in addition to all those prerequisites for the previous experimental verification of Ohm's law and experimental verification of series circuits lectures. If you've been following this playlist in its intended sequence, or if you're already intimately familiar with these topics, no worries. If not, I definitely recommend hitting these prerequisite lectures available at the Big Bad Tech channel prior to continuing, since we'll be following a similar format. This activity is especially exciting for me because it represents the synthesis of a number of topics and presents yet another opportunity to demonstrate that I am not some dim-witted peddler of nonsense. These properties are real, verifiable, and extremely useful tools. I'm encouraging you to get involved with this activity and pause the lecture often to perform the required calculations. If you get lost, I'll be right there to guide you to the correct solution. This exercise should be especially satisfying because using limited observations in electrical theory, you can predict reality. That's the point. Real parallel circuit properties with some margin of error really do work like I've been telling you they do. First, we're going to build a basic three resistor parallel circuit and measure the voltage across each component, the current through each component, and the source current. Then we'll intentionally open and short out components to observe the effect this might have on other circuit properties. Finally, we'll bring it on home with a quick lab activity that employs not elements in parallel, but rather sources. Part one of this activity makes use of a parallel circuit of three resistors supplied by a single source. In this case, the source is 12 volts, R1 is 270 ohms, R2 is 330 ohms, R3 is 470 ohms. Pause the lecture and solve for the voltage across each component, the current through each component, the power dissipated by each component, the source current, and the power supplied by the source. Here's the challenge though. You are not authorized to directly calculate total resistance until the very last step. This challenge will ensure that you make use of the available tool set I've laid out before you, notably basic parallel circuit properties, Kirchhoff's current law, and the current divider rule. Accept the challenge and do not be lured into solving for total resistance up front. You'll be glad you did so now when presented with challenging troubleshooting scenarios with only partial information in the future. Here's how I'm going to solve for the desired quantities. You may have used different steps in a different sequence, but our answer should agree. I'll start by using the most fundamental of basic parallel properties. The voltage across elements in parallel is the same. E equals V1 equals V2 equals V3. If the source voltage is 12 volts, so is V1, V2, and V3. With a known voltage drop across known resistors, we can easily use Ohm's law to calculate the current through all three resistors. Where I1 is equal to V1 divided by R1, substituting in the necessary values, we find I1 to be approximately 44.4 milliampers. I2 is V2 divided by R2, Substituting in the necessary values, we find I2 to be approximately 36.4 milliampers. Finally, I3 equals V3 divided by R3. Substituting in the necessary values, we find I3 to be approximately 25.5 milliampers. Given the current values for all three resistors, we can use Kirchhoff's current law to determine the source current IS, where IS equals I1 plus I2 plus I3. Substituting in the necessary values, we find source current to equal approximately 106.3 milliampers. Given the 12 volt power supply is supplying 106.3 milliampers of source current to this complete parallel circuit, we can solve for power input to this system as source voltage times source current. Substituting in the necessary values yields approximately 1.28 watts or 1,276.1 milliwatts. Now we can calculate the power dissipated by each element. The power dissipated by R1 is the voltage across it times the current through it. Substituting in the necessary values, 
we find P1 equals approximately 533.3 milliwatts. This is cause for inspection. 533.3 milliwatts is ever so slightly higher than a half watt or 500 milliwatt resistor's power rating. If this was a circuit you intended to deploy for a length of time, utilize in a harsh environment, or sell to litigious people, you need to step up to at least a one watt rated resistor because this would most likely be the first part to fail. The power dissipated by R2 is the voltage across it squared divided by its resistance. Substituting in the necessary values, we find P2 to be approximately 436.4 milliwatts. Given power input always equals power output, we can use this understanding to solve for our remaining power figure P3. Power input to this system is equal to the summation of individual power dissipations. Pn equals P1 plus P2 plus P3. Given we've solved for Pn, P1, and P2, we can substitute in the necessary values and solve for P3, where P3 equals approximately 306.4 milliwatts. We can check this value by independently solving for power dissipated by R3 via other means. P3 is also the current through its squared times its resistance. Substituting in the necessary values, again yields approximately 306.4 milliwatts. I am reasonably certain our answers are correct and we could proceed with the hardware portion of this lab. Notice at no time did the solution to this problem necessitate the direct calculation of total resistance. To those rigidly reliant upon a complete and clearly marked trail, you will be sorely unfit for a career as a troubleshooter. Very rarely are you given the complete picture and you are often reliant upon creative interpretation of basic parallel properties, reasoning ability, and good, organized, and efficient work practices. This being said, one can solve for total resistance using several equally valid interpretations. Notably, a restatement of Ohm's law from the perspective of the source, where RT equals the source voltage divided by source current, two permutations of the power equations, where RT equals the source voltage squared divided by total power input, and RT equals the power input divided by the source current squared, or for extremely unimaginative drones, your choice of the parallel resistance formulas. Either way, any of these calculations yield approximately 112.8 ohms. This is a great check. If you've done everything correct, either method should link up and give each other a high five and a hearty bear hug. Any one result misses the agreed upon rally point and drives right on by, you can be assured that one or more of your assumptions or calculations were made in error. Note other opportunities to check our work. Given all elements in a parallel network have the same voltage drop, and Ohm's law states that the current through an element is the voltage divided by resistance, the smallest resistor in this parallel relationship should have the largest current through it, and the largest resistor in this parallel relationship should have the smallest current through it. This is in fact what we're observing. R1 is the smallest resistor and has the largest current through it. R3 is the largest resistor and has the smallest current through it. Additionally, Kirchhoff's current law states that the sum of currents entering a node should equal the sum of currents leaving a node. What goes in must come out. I1 plus I2 plus I3 does in fact equal our source current IS. We can be reasonably certain our results are correct. Taking a brief scan of power figures, we see R1, the smallest resistor, is dissipating the most amount of power because it has the most current through it. R3, our largest resistor, is dissipating the least amount of power because it has the least amount of current through it. Finally, power input does equal power output. Pn equals P1 plus P2 plus P3, as expected. Such a quick scan of expected results, even if you're sure they're correct, prevents the chance of a simple clerical error, for example, transposing I1 with I2 and vice versa, from becoming a regretful second guessing of ordinarily correct results. Stay organized and do yourself the favor of making sure everything is in its place before you begin. I'm your electronic instructor, not your mama. Your mama should have taught you to put your stuff where it belongs. Last but not least, make sure the components you intend to use can handle the expected power dissipation. We're already second guessing the choice of a half watt rated R1's ability to handle 533 milliwatts. 
but take a quick look at the others. R2 is dissipating 436.4 milliwatts, so a half watt rated resistor would do the trick, although a one watt rated resistor might in the long run be a better choice. R3 is dissipating the smallest amount of power in our circuit at 306.4 milliwatts, so again a half watt rated resistor might do the trick. A resistor with a quarter watt power rating, or 250 milliwatts, might work for a little bit, but in the long run, it would be the component that fails first. In this case, we're not going to keep our circuit built for any length of time, nor are we going to sell it to litigious people, so we're just going to use what we grab from supply. Now, well armed with expectations, we're ready to begin the lab. Pause the lecture and see if you can determine the four band color code for the three resistors we require, assuming plus or minus 5% tolerance. A 270 ohm resistor is red, purple, brown, gold. A 330 ohm resistor is orange, orange, brown, gold. A 470 ohm resistor is yellow, purple, brown, gold. Go fetch. Do yourself the favor of checking the resistance values of the components prior to assembling the circuit. No sense in using the wrong resistor as a result of a mistaken reading of the color code or a bum component that is just going to fall apart the moment an electron knocks on the front door. Our 270 ohm resistor is actually 0.2661 kilo ohms or 266.1 ohms, well inside the expected tolerance range. Our 330 ohm resistor is actually 327.5 ohms, well inside the expected tolerance range. Our 470 ohm resistor is actually 461 ohms, well inside the expected tolerance range. If we twist these three resistors together in a parallel or side-by-side -side relationship and take the resistance reading from node to node, notice our total resistance is ever so slightly less than our calculated value of 112.8 ohms because the observed values for our individual resistors was slightly undershot each time. If our total resistance for this parallel combination is ever so slightly lower than we'd expect, I'd be willing to wager that the source current through this relationship will be ever so slightly higher than our calculated value. This being said, it's not a dramatic departure from our expectations, and we're going to proceed as intended. If you inadvertently grabbed a 2.7 ohm or a 2.7 kilo ohm resistor instead of a 270 ohm resistor, or hook the correct resistors in a totally incorrect fashion, we'd be observing a resistance value for this combination radically different than our expected total resistance of 112.8 ohms. The point is, don't jump out of a perfectly good airplane without a properly packed chute. Proceed cautiously and do it right the first time. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. A brief comment on this parallel circuit before we begin. It's not on the protoboard. If you build this circuit correctly on the protoboard, you should observe no change between this configuration and that of the one you built on your protoboard. If you deploy the circuit on the protoboard incorrectly, you'll observe a different total resistance value. If I call the top or left end of this parallel combination node A, notice how one terminal each of R1, R2, and R3 are all connected to it. If I call the right or bottom end of this parallel combination node B, Notice how the other terminal of R1, R2, and R3 are all connected to it. There are only two nodes that define a parallel relationship across which all two terminal components are hooked. There is no low resistance path or short circuit also in parallel with this circuit. Three paths and three paths only start at node A, and three paths and three paths only end at node B. Now let's build the same parallel circuit on the protoboard. Here is one of many different valid parallel configurations of this circuit. Node A is the group of interconnected points defined by row 20, columns A through E. Node B is the group of interconnected points defined by row 30, columns A through E. This will work, but notice how cramped the circuit is. It's as densely packed as the dumb ideas in your lab partner's head. This isn't the best use of the protoboard, and taking voltage and current readings using this circuit will be especially problematic and confusing. By all means, spread out and make use of the available space. Here's another far easier to use rendition of the same parallel circuit. 
Here I've used the blue wires on the top to tie together the group of interconnected points defined by row 20 columns A through E, row 20 columns F through J, and row 20 column A through E in the other terminal strip into, in effect, a giant node A, very similar to our schematic. Additionally, I've used the blue wires in the bottom to tie together the group of interconnected points defined by row 30 columns A through E, row 30 columns F through J, and row 30 columns A through E in the other terminal strip into, again, a giant node B, very similar to our schematic. Notice how much easier it is to visualize this circuit and utilize and take measurements of it. If we take a resistance reading of the whole circuit, we again see 112.2 ohms of resistance, and we could be reasonably certain we built the circuit as intended. Notice I'm building the circuit on the protoboard almost exactly like the schematic is pictured. Call me lazy or call me efficient. I like having a one-to-one -one correspondence between what's on my board and what's on my schematic. You can use as many or as little jump of wires as you want, but my advice is to use as many as you need. No more, no less. Notice I took a resistance reading of the circuit while it was unenergized and disconnected from a source. Any other method would damage your meter or at the very least produce an erroneous reading. Sticking with this expanded parallel arrangement, let's set up our voltage source to supply 12 volts. Here I'm using the DMM and DC voltmeter mode to adjust the power supply output to 12 volts for an unloaded condition. Unloaded means the power supply is not supplying current because I've yet to actually hook it to my circuit. Once I actually hook the circuit to my power supply, notice the output voltage slightly dips to 11.9 volts when it's actually supplying current. By keeping my voltmeter attached while in loaded conditions, I'm aware of this dip and can readjust the supply as needed back up to our required 12 volts. Now being truly supplied by a 12 volt source, we can proceed with the observation portion of the lab. Being this is a parallel circuit, this single voltage measurement should be sufficient for all components. However, I'd like to belabor this point by taking three additional voltage measurements in this same circuit at the following points, across R1 directly, across R2 directly, and finally across to R3 directly. V1 is observed to be 12 volts. V2 is observed to be 12 volts. V3 is observed to be 12 volts. Voltage across components hooked in parallel is the same. Isn't that convenient? What's not so convenient is taking current measurements inside a parallel circuit. In this case, we're going to take four different current measurements, IS, I1, I2, and I3. Each of our four different current measurements require the following steps. The power supply must be turned off. The circuit must be broken at our chosen point of insertion. The ammeter must be placed in series with the element is intended to measure current through. And then the power supply must be turned on. The measurement of source current requires placement of the ammeter between the positive terminal of our supply and node A. This requires the introduction of another node in our schematic. I'll call it A prime. Notice A prime and A are separate nodes. And the only way to get to A from A prime is through the ammeter. If A prime was connected to A, there would be no incentive for current to travel through the ammeter. And the ammeter would in effect be bypassed by having its indoor connected to its outdoor. No current would flow through it and the ammeter would read zero amps despite there being a clearly energized circuit. All current must be funneled through the ammeter if the ammeter is to correctly read source current. In theory, current measurements require the introduction of another node on the protoboard. But in practice, very often by simply removing a lead from the protoboard, you are in effect doing the same thing. Notice all current emanating from my power supply positive terminal is entering the red lead, and the same red lead is plugged into the banana jack on the protoboard. All current leaves the banana jack and enters the orange wire and is channeled straight into the ammeter indoor. Source current enters the indoor, flows through the ammeter, and comes out the outdoor. There is no other way to get to our parallel circuit other than by going through the ammeter. Take your time and think about proper placement of ammeters. Draw a picture and visualize current traveling through your circuit. Don't rush this important step and damage your meter your circuit, your source, or yourself. Don't worry about damaging your lab partner. 
I believe a sizable cache bounty for their pelt might exist. In this case, the ammeter is reading 106.8 milliampers, very close to what we expected. The measurement of I1 and I1 only requires placement of the ammeter between the node A and the top of R1. The only way to get to R1 is through the ammeter. What we've effectively created is a series parallel arrangement in that the path consisting of the ammeter in series with just R1 is placed in parallel with other paths. Again, in practice, very often by simply removing a lead from the protoboard, you are in effect doing the same thing. All source current enters a node A, and only current bound for R1 travels through the ammeter to get to the top terminal of R1. We're observing close to 45.1 milliampers through R1, very close to our expected values. We're going to measure the current through R2 slightly differently by placing the ammeter between the bottom terminal of R2 and our bottom node B. You can do this. Current through elements in series with one another is the same. Source current entering node A splits into its intended destinations. I2 travels through R2 into the ammeter and the ammeter only, out of the ammeter and into node B. I2 is observed to be 36.6 milliampers, very close to our expected value. Finally, we'll measure the current through R3 by placing the ammeter between node A and the top terminal of R3. Source current entering node A splits into its intended destinations. That current bound for R3 travels into the ammeter, out of the ammeter, and into R3 and R3 only. I3 is observed to be 25.7 milliampers, very close to our expected value. Theoretically, we're done with the lab, but let's poke this circuit a little bit with a sharp stick and see what we learn. Alternate current measurements exist. For example, we could measure I2 and I3 simultaneously by placing an ammeter between node A and a new all-purpose node I'll call A prime, where A prime has not a single resistor hooked to it, but rather both R2 and R3 in parallel. In this case, any source current bound for R1 entering node A continues on its merry way, but that current bound for both R2 and R3 must be forced through this single choke point to be counted. You can think of an ammeter as an electron counting cowboy. Any electrons intended to graze in the R2 and R3 pastures need to get channeled through the single chute that leads to R2 and R3. This is a perfect time to highlight the use of the current divider rule for more than two resistor parallel combinations. If source current entering node A was known to be 106.8 milliampers, we could simplify R2 in parallel with R3 to be a single imaginary resistor I'll call R prime where a 330 ohm resistor in parallel with a 470 ohm resistor yields approximately 193.9 ohms. Recall that the current divider rule states that the current entering a parallel combination of two elements splits inversely proportional between the two elements. Where current through the element of interest is the resistance of the one we're not interested in divided by the summation of both resistances times incoming current. I1 equals R0 divided by R1 plus R0 times I in. Intending to solve for the current through R prime, the imaginary resistor comprising the parallel combination of R2 and R3, we can apply the current divider rule to this situation. Where the current through R prime is in actuality I2 and I3 combined. Substituting in the necessary values, we find the current through R prime to be 62.2 milliampers very close to what we're observing for the lumped combination of I2 and I3 when the ammeter is employed in this fashion. With the understanding that 106.8 milliampers of source current is entering node A and 62.2 milliampers is making its way in an undistinguishable mass to R2 and R3, by using Kirchhoff's current law, we can say that the remainder of this current, or 44.6 milliampers, should be traveling through R1 very close to what we observed for I1 when taken individually. Very rarely will a lab go this well, so let's introduce two common errors and discuss the steps taken to identify and resolve them. These two common scenarios are opens and shorts. Opens. An open is an infinite resistance through which no current can flow. An open element inside a parallel circuit removes the open element, and the open element only 
from the circuit. With no current flowing through the open element, there will be no voltage drop across the open element. This being said, since there is a voltage rise, there will be a voltage drop. The voltage drop will appear across the open and across those elements still inside the parallel relationship. Here I've opened the connection between R3 and node A. No current flows through R3. How has this single element affected I1 and I2? Take your time and think about what I'm asking. Has I1 or I2 gone up, gone down, stopped altogether, or stayed the same since R3 is no longer carrying current? R1 and R2 could care less if their good-for-nothing neighbor R3 is gone. They are still going to continue drawing their required current from this 12-volt source because they are still in parallel with it. I1 with R3 open is still 45.1 milliampers. I2 with R3 open is still 36.6 milliampers. Now, predict what happened to source current given these observations and your knowledge of how the addition or removal of elements inside a parallel relationship affects total resistance seen by the source. Did the source current go up, go down, stop altogether, or stay the same? Take your time and think about this because I'm going to make you feel really bad if you get this question wrong. If you said anything different than go down, I'm asking you to stop and consider a career in something unrelated to electronics or perhaps revisit the entire basic electronics playlist starting at square one with a renewed sensor of vigor and potency. Yes, with removal of a path in parallel, the source current has no choice but to go down because total resistance has increased. It should be super obvious from the schematic that with R3 removed from consideration, that IS is now only I1 plus I2, since I3 equals zero. An ammeter used to measure source current with R3 open indicates only 81.4 milliampers of current, exactly as we predicted. Shorts. A short is the errant addition of a low resistance path in parallel to a component. The parallel combination of anything and in effect a zero ohm resistor effectively yields zero ohms of resistance for the shorted component. A shorted component is to be generally avoided in a parallel circuit because the short affects the whole parallel combination total resistance dramatically decreases, source current dramatically increases, potentially with catastrophic results. If we were to short out R3, the 470 ohm resistor, by adding a low resistance wire in parallel to it, this current limited power supply would quickly enter overload conditions and refuse to provide any more current in excess of its preset maximum. An ammeter used to measure source current while R3 is shorted out reads a head scratching 567.3 milliampers. This particular power supply is preset maximum. If the radically different amount of source current isn't enough clue to tell you something's wrong, the LED on the power supply indicating that it is in overload or constant current mode should be a dead giveaway. In addition to a low resistance wire placed in parallel, other equally heinous actions can effectively short out components. Consider a resistor with both terminals connected at the same set of interconnected points, defining a node. Two terminal components aren't ordinarily hooked to the same node and must be placed node to node if they are to perform their intended function. A resistor, regardless of the magnitude, presents no opposition to current flow when deployed in such a manner. Consider incorrect placement of instrumentation inside a parallel circuit. For example, an ammeter placed not in series with the resistors intended to measure current through as required, but rather in parallel. An ammeter can be modeled as an extremely low resistance path. This low resistance path is in parallel to one resistor in our parallel relationship, and it effectively shorts out the whole parallel relationship. If we were using a current limited power supply, current would again spike to the preset maximum. If this source was not current limited, but was rather protected by a circuit breaker or fuse in series with this circuit, the shorted circuit would cause current draw in excess of the breaker's or fuse's rated current, and the breaker would pop or the fuse would blow, effectively turning off the whole circuit, preventing potential damage. A short, an event ordinarily associated with a large current draw, precipitated in an open, an event normally associated with no current draw. Long story short, 
If current is too high, it's because resistance is too low. Either you're using the wrong components, you're building the wrong circuit, or you're shorting out components with a low resistance path, be it an errant wire, incorrect use of the ammeter, or incorrect placement in the protoboard. Shorted components cause current to rise. Because of the reckless tendency to take the whole ship to the bottom along with them, shorts are to be generally avoided in parallel circuits. Before we wrap up today's lecture, let's do a bonus round activity featuring not elements in parallel, but rather sources in parallel. Be warned, we'll start out with some nice, shiny, mathematically perfect entities and quickly progress to the nitty gritty, dirty details of real world nuisances and straight up deal breakers. Recall from the Kirchhoff's voltage lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel, I strongly discourage placing voltage sources with different magnitudes directly in parallel with one another. With no current controlling element between the two sources, such a connection would cause the higher voltage source to rapidly discharge into the lower voltage source with potentially catastrophic levels of current. This being said, a voltage source of equal magnitude to the first is welcome in a parallel relationship because voltage across elements hooked in parallel is the same at least in a mathematical sense. The real world, however, does have some messy details I'm glossing over right now. We'll cover these details later. In a simplified version, this additional source in parallel now assists the first source by supplying a portion of the required current for any load hooked to the circuit. Many hands make light work. This is used often in a battery bank in an off-grid arrangement, or similarly, one in an electric car. A battery, or series strings of several batteries, is simply placed in parallel with another battery or a series string of the same value. Let's say these are both 48 volt sources, potentially four 12 volt batteries in a series aiding string. However, each source was limited to safely supplying 100 amps. Working singly, a 48 volt battery supplying 100 amps to an electrical load would be limited to supplying 48 times 100, or 4.8 kilowatts. If the resistance of the electrical load decreased, no further current draw could occur because the battery has reached its current limit. However, a parallel combination of two such batteries simply increases the maximum current and power range capable of being supplied. In this case, a parallel combination of two 48 volt sources, each limited to supplying 100 amps, could effectively supply 200 amps to an electrical load and deliver twice the power at 9.6 kilowatts. Even in the event of moderate current draw, each parallel string would only be delivering a representative portion of the required current. Such an arrangement ensures that the burden is ideally equally shared. This equal sharing of current draw is one of the messy details I was referring to earlier. As you are no doubt aware, there is often an unequal partitioning of effort in you and your lab partner's professional relationship, and one can expect no less from a slacker battery paired up with a regular dynamo such as yourself. The slacker is just going to kick back and let the more powerful of the parallel duo do all the work and then swoop in at the very last moment and put their name on the lab report. Go team! In especially problematic parallel relationships, a small voltage drop in one battery Upsets the voltage across elements in parallel is the same concept I've been yammering on and on about for like the last four lectures. It's only a matter of time before both batteries are sapped as each battery essentially leapfrogs each other in a race to the bottom. This is kind of like one of those relationships where you engage your lab partner in a specially slow moving race of who can out slack one another and explore the furthest depths of depravity. Before you know it, your lab partner is locked up in some Mexican jail you're kicked out of electronics class getting a business degree. Rock bottom. Population U. All of this could have been prevented with a simple road sign that says do not enter, exit only. This is meant to imply a one-way connection for current leaving a battery in parallel circuits. Current is only to be applied from the battery to a load and not from battery to battery. This could be accomplished with a simple electrical device I introduced at the very end of the Kirchhoff's Voltage Law lecture, the diode. We'll have time and occasion to visit the diode in detail in later lectures at the Big Bad Tech channel, but for now, you can think of a diode as an electrical check valve, in that it allows current flow in one direction and not the other. 
the application of such a device is pretty obvious in a real-world parallel relationship of sources. Current from one source can't backfeed the other source in parallel. Right now, though, let's just ignore these messy details and we'll return to them in a bit. Long story short, real-world devices aren't mathematically perfect entities, and sometimes the tiny details have seriously big consequences. Continuing on with another application of sources in parallel, this is a common arrangement with solar panels, utilized in both the traditional centralized inverter topology and newer microinverter topology. We'll cover the details of solar panels, inverters, and microinverters in later lectures, but realize for the centralized inverter topology, each solar panel can be idealized as an identical DC source. A single series aiding string of 15 solar panels, each providing, let's say, 30 volts, would have 15 times 30 volts, or 450 volts across it. If each solar panel was limited to providing 8 amps, the whole series string of 15 could not produce more than 8 amps, because current in a series relationship is the same. Therefore, this series string of 15 solar panels at 30 volts each could at most produce 450 volts times 8 amps, or 3.6 kilowatts of DC power to the centralized inverter to be converted into grid-compliant AC power with a proper magnitude, frequency, and phase shift for export. If another series string of 15 identical panels were placed in parallel with the first, the voltage across both strings would be the same, the only difference being an additional 8 amps entering the centralized inverter. In this case, the parallel combination of these series strings is delivering 450 volts times 16 amps, or 7.2 kilowatts of power. An alternative to this centralized inverter topology is known as a microinverter, essentially distributed inversion. A microinverter is a small power electronics device on the back of every DC power producing photovoltaic panel that converts it to grid compliant AC at the point of production. Each microinverter takes the 30 volt 8 amp or 240 watt DC input and outputs 240 volt AC at 1 amp, and they're all placed directly in parallel with one another. This diagram is going to get super confusing, so there's the first six of them all placed in parallel with one another. There's the remaining 24 connections. This parallel combination of 30 panels and microinverters would produce only at 240 volts because they're all in parallel to one another. However, each of the 30 panels is delivering 1 amp of current to the trunk lines for a total of 30 amps at 240 volts. 240 volts times 30 amps again yields 7.2 kilowatts of power for these 30 PV panels linked with microinverters. Advantages and disadvantages exist for both methodologies. The centralized inverter is prone to the fallen leaf or the lost frisbee phenomenon and that partially shading one of the panels in one of the series strings affects current output for that whole string. In a microinverter arrangement, only the partially shaded panel suffers a loss in production. The principal disadvantage of the microinverter arrangement is the glaringly obvious reality that you have to buy 30 microinverters instead of one centralized inverter. Again, we'll discuss PV arrays, array and inverter sizing, inverters, microinverters, and more in later lectures. For now, realize these parallel combinations of sources are all doing the same thing. They're all at the same voltage, they're just capable of providing more current when the demand is there. In this spirit, let's see if you can make a 20 volt power supply that is capable of supplying at maximum 450 milliampers of current, deliver 16 watts to a 25 ohm electrical load. Don't try too hard though, because it can't. Given current equals the square root of power divided by resistance, substituting in the necessary numbers, we find this 25 ohm load needs to have at least 800 milliampers of current going through it to dissipate 16 watts. Sounds like this is a perfect opportunity for two 20 volt sources, each limited to supplying 450 milliampers, to link up in a parallel combination. In this case, the total current draw of 800 milliampers will be less than the 900 milliampers this parallel combination is capable of delivering. Here's the 25 ohm electrical load we'll be using. 
This is the high power potentiometer I introduced in the experimental verification of series circuits properties lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel. It's basically a giant potentiometer that can handle pretty much anything this measly little benchtop power supply can dish out. Let's build a parallel arrangement of sources using the two adjustable outputs of a triple output power supply. Recall from the Lab Practices Intro to Power Supplies lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel, this particular power supply has three selectable modes regarding the relationship of the two adjustable power outputs. The outputs can be independent from each other, in series with each other, or in parallel with each other. Right now, these two supplies are in independent mode and not in any way related or attached to one another, and both are independently adjustable. I'll use the DMM and DC voltmeter mode to adjust the A power supply to 20 volts between its two terminals. I'll then use the DMM and DC voltmeter mode to adjust the B power supply to 20 volts between its two terminals. Now I'll tie the two negative terminals of these formerly independent power supplies together. The coiled up red cable in this picture is serving this purpose. With a reference lead on the B positive terminal, the voltmeter reads essentially no difference between these sources. I am free to tie the two positive terminals together in a parallel relationship. Here the outputs of both power supplies enter the single input to the ammeter, essentially a single node, and a single lead from the ammeter outdoor goes to the potentiometer. In this case, two power supplies, both individually limited to supplying at most 450 milliampers, are working together to supply 794 milliampers of current at 20 volts to the 25 ohm resistor, effectively delivering close to our required amount of 16 watts of power. Notice neither power supply has entered overload because they're both working just under their maximum permissible current draw. Are both sources contributing equally to the 794 milliampers of current draw? In a mathematically perfect world, they would be. To investigate this fact, we'll have to bring some more instrumentation into play with a bench clearing brawl of ammeters. Here's three ammeters simultaneously employed to measure each individual source's contribution and the resultant load current. The top ammeter is reading the current supplied by the A source at 392.5 milliampers. The middle ammeter is reading the current supplied by the B source at 398.6 milliampers. Finally, the bottom ammeter is reading the current delivered to the load by both the A and B sources at 794.8 milliampers. There is a little bit of error because neither of these DMMs are calibrated with each other, but for the most part, the sources are sharing current draw equally. Way to go guys, way to work together. Now let's purposely dial back source A's contribution to the effort to 365.5 milliampers. Who picks up the slack? Yeah, you guessed it the other parallel source. The B source is now contributing 427.1 milliampers. The electrical load is still receiving the required current draw of just under 800 milliampers. It's just that it's coming from two unequal sources now. As long as neither source is maxed out, the load still receives its required current draw. What's interesting to note is the overtaxation that's occurring on the B power supply. This is one of those messy details I was referring to earlier. When one source slacks, the other has to pick up the slack to get the job done. Does this remind you of a certain lab partner? If these were two batteries instead of a multiple output benchtop power supply, not only would we expect to observe different lifespans because of the disparity in current draw, we'd also see a voltage difference between the two batteries providing two different currents, which brings us back full circle to our understanding of voltage across elements hooked in parallel is the same, my general prohibition of hooking voltage sources with different magnitudes in parallel. Don't do it. See, I told you it was messy. I'll clean up the mess in a moment after we take a look at the benchtop power supply in parallel mode. Notice this whole time we've kept the power supply in independent mode and haven't made use of the series or parallel mode. Let's work smarter and not harder and make use of this handy selector switch. Not all power supplies have this feature, nor do all those power supplies that do have this feature work in this exact same manner, but it's a neat discussion topic nonetheless, and worthy of a quick look. We've already dealt with the details of the series mode, 
in the Experimental Verification of Series Circuit Properties lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel. And if you'll recall, both the series mode and parallel mode simply close or open the set of switches inside the power supply that place the two normally independent outputs in series or in parallel with one another. In independent mode, the two adjustable power supplies are totally unconnected to each other in any way, shape, or form, and they are both independently adjustable. In series mode, a switch is closed between the B supply positive terminal and the A supply negative terminal, and the sources are stacked on top or in line with one another in a series aiding relationship. In parallel mode, two different switches are closed between both the positive and the negative terminals of the B and A supply, and the sources are placed side by side with one another in a parallel relationship. At its most basic level, the switch saves you the necessity of having to use external wires to tie the two negative terminals and the two positive terminals together. Far more important than this trivial time saver though is the internal circuitry of the power supply turns this parallel combination into one of those mathematically perfect entities I told you does not normally exist. It takes care of any voltage differential by handing over control of both sources to a single set of voltage and current knobs. This is super handy because it ensures there is no voltage mismatch between the two supplies and that both supplies equally share the current. In this case, neither the A or B supply is independently adjustable as it was previously, nor can I take a current measurement delivered from each source since the connections made in the parallel mode are internal to the power supply. However, this is a small price to pay for not having to worry about maintaining a balance between the supplies. Let's make use of this mode to create two 20 volt power supplies, each individually limited to 450 milliampers in parallel with one another to deliver approximately 800 milliampers of current to a 25 ohm electrical load. In parallel mode, the A supply individually reads 20 volts across its terminals, as does the B supply. Despite there being no external connection between the positive terminals of both sources, there's no voltage differential between them because they are internally connected to each other. Same thing for the negative terminals. If this is true, there should be a 20 volt differential between the B supply negative and the A supply positive. Our DMM indicates that this is true. A similar check of the differential between the A supply negative, the B supply positive also yields 20 volts. Again, this parallel connection is made internal to the power supply positive to positive, negative to negative. If this is true, we should be able to connect an electrical load between either positive and either negative. In this case, a potentiometer set to approximately 25 ohms is drawing close to 800 milliampers from a 20 volt source as expected. Again, notice there's no external connection on the power supply. If I didn't understand what parallel mode did, this might look like an incomplete circuit, but it's not, and we can amaze and impress maybe even confuse people with only a superficial understanding of the power supply and its three different modes. All right, we are just about to end this lecture on a high note, having only briefly mentioned the dirty details of voltage sources in parallel, and then quickly resolve these nuisances and deal breakers using a convenient mode setting on the power supply that does the dirty work for you. Any other instructor would end the lecture here and let you go outside and play on the monkey bars. But I'm not about to let you off so easy. Let's get down and dirty and put some batteries in parallel and witness the less than desirable results and potential solutions to these problems. Here's a pair of ordinary 9 volt batteries. The slightly used one with the red band on it has an open circuit voltage of almost 9 volts. The fresh one has an open circuit voltage of almost 9.7 volts. When I tie the negative terminals together, and place my reference lead on the red battery's positive terminal, the voltmeter shows that the fresh battery is approximately 0.7-ish volts higher. No big whoop, right? 9 volts versus 9.7 volts? If we were to put these guys in parallel with each other, what is Kirchhoff's ghost going to do? Rise from the grave and take my birthday away? No, but Kirchhoff is damn sure he's going to make the fresh battery backfeed in this case, 38 milliampers into the partially drained red battery. No electrical load is hooked to the parallel combo, and an ammeter placed between these two batteries still indicates a current draw. 
this is not a good idea for batteries whose intended purpose is to be a portable source of backup power. Additionally, this type of battery is a primary battery, not a secondary battery. It isn't supposed to be recharged. This current will not only drain the fresh battery, it'll damage the one that's receiving the current. What's also interesting is the voltage measurement across the parallel combination of batteries. It's not the output of the fresh battery at almost 9.7 volts, but rather 9.5-ish volts, indicating the output voltage has been lowered because of the mismatch and the resultant current draw. This voltage mismatch and excess current drain occurs even when the parallel combination is delivering current to an electrical load. Here is just the fresh source at 9.7-ish volts, delivering approximately 19.8 milliampers to a 510 ohm resistor as expected. Here is just the partially depleted source at 9-ish volts, delivering 18.3 milliampers to a 510 ohm resistor as expected. The sources seem to be working fine independently. However, when linked up in a parallel combination, things immediately go south. The draw from the fresh battery spikes to 48.6 milliampers. The ammeter on the partially depleted battery indicates it's receiving 32.5 milliampers. Note the negative sign. 32.5 milliampers is entering the ammeter outdoor and leaving the indoor. The fresh source is delivering 48.6 milliampers, and the electrical load in this case is receiving the excess 16.1 milliampers not being diverted to the partially depleted battery. This seems like a pretty hopeless situation. However, since I keep mentioning parallel combos of sources and application examples like off-grade battery banks, electric cars, and solar panels, you know at some gut level I wouldn't lead you astray. So this has got to work. Fear not, we can fix this with a couple diodes. Recall that a diode is essentially an electrical check valve and that it allows current in one direction, indicated by the arrow on the schematic, but disallows it in the other direction. I like to think of the bar on the schematic as a brick wall that conventional current cannot surmount, and the arrow is a one-way passage through the diode. Forward bias diode, one where the anode has a higher voltage than the cathode, conducts. A reversed bias diode, one where the cathode has a higher voltage than the anode, does not conduct. Consider what would happen if diodes were placed on each battery in the following configuration. If the source on the right was ever so slightly higher than the source on the left, the diode on the left source would be reversed biased and prevent current from entering the left source. The forward biased diode on the right source would allow current to leave it and travel through the intended electrical load only. This simple electrical check valve prevents the discharge of the higher voltage source into the lower voltage source, an obvious benefit. The drawback to this configuration is that the diode servicing the lower voltage source is reverse biased and isn't conducting at all. In this case, the lower voltage source isn't contributing anything more to this parallel combination than the sixth member of an away team on Star Trek. For those individuals that don't understand this reference, the only purpose of the sixth member of an away team on Star Trek was to meet an early, often horrible fate at the hands of some unseen alien menace. Let's build this circuit incorporating diodes and see if this is the case. An ammeter placed between these two mismatched batteries with diodes on the positive terminals indicates no current is flowing between them. This is a good thing. Let's check the voltage at various points of our circuit to see which diode is forward biased and which diode is reverse biased. We'll deal with some of the intricacies of diodes in later lectures at the Big Bad Tech channel. However, I realize there is a tiny voltage drop across a diode whose magnitude is dependent upon the construction of the diode. On the upstream side of the diode servicing the fresh battery, we see 9.6-ish volts as expected. On the downstream side of this same diode, we see 9.3-ish volts. This is the tiny voltage drop I was just referring to earlier. The diode servicing the fresh battery is forward biased and would allow current to flow. What about the diode servicing the partially depleted battery? The voltage at its upstream end is 9-ish volts. Its downstream end is 9.3-ish volts as we just saw. This diode is reverse biased and is not conducting. Not only is this equivalent to a do not enter sign on the partially depleted battery that prevents the fresh battery from draining into it, 
this is also equivalent to an open circuit and that the partially depleted battery cannot provide current. When the parallel combination of batteries with diodes attached delivers current to the 510 ohm resistor, this electrical load draws 18.3 milliampers of current as expected. From which source though is this current coming from? An ammeter on the output of just the fresh battery indicates it's supplying 18.3 milliampers. An ammeter on the output of the partially depleted battery only indicates it's the one that's kicked back on the couch, letting its partner do all the heavy lifting. The diode's purpose was to prevent a small voltage mismatch between these batteries from depleting the parallel combination. However, it does come at a price of letting one battery be lazy until such time the voltage imbalance is corrected. We'll deal with the specifics of batteries and diodes in later lectures. But for now, the take home point about voltage sources in parallel is this. Yes, you can put them in parallel. However, you must be exceedingly careful that voltage is the same. Sometimes this calls for excess components and extremely cautious and meticulous measurements. Sometimes this calls for a power supply with a parallel mode that does the balancing act for you. All right, I believe we accomplished what we intended to do during this lecture and prove once again that the material I present is real, verifiable, useful, and above all, true. In conclusion, this activity verified parallel circuit properties using real-world components and common electrical instrumentation. We observed voltage across elements in parallel circuits is the same, and verified Ohm's law, Kirchhoff's current law, and the current divider rule. Additionally, we learned the effects of opens and shorts inside parallel circuits. Finally, we placed independent voltage sources in parallel with one another and learned the difficult balancing act between mismatched sources. Finally, we used a handy shortcut available on some multiple output power supplies to increase output current and minimize external wiring. Remember to get inside a safe and supportive lab environment and apply these techniques on real-world components and see for yourself the truth. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest. We'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource. Be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.